Good afternoon. And thank you for taking your seats. I, I was good on my promise. You got lunch, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. My name is Patrick Murphy, and I'm the research director at PPIC. Um, want to sort of welcome you and, and get you focused on our next panel. This panel, I'm going to give a little preamble so you have some sense of the context. We're calling it Government 2.0. The previous panel, we had a little bit of insight and perspective into the very diverse and, and dynamic changes in, in California's demographics and the effect that that has and potential impact on their leaders. We're going to shift gears a little bit and take a look at and focus on the institutions now in California and whether they're in a position that they can meet the challenges that the state is going to be facing down the road. So on that line, if we take a little brief look back we can see a number of changes that have taken place, and I think positive changes, that sort of set some of this up. On one hand, it's already been mentioned, we've had some electoral reforms, particularly the changes in term limits. And I think those changes have at least introduced the possibility for more stability in our leadership going forward. We've also had some major policy shifts that have taken place um, in the area of healthcare for certain. Uh, a few years ago, more recently, in, in public safety realignment which changed the landscape of, of corrections in, in the state, and also in terms of the way in which we finance our K through 12 schools. And those changes have taken decision making out of Sacramento and has pushed it down to the local level, which also is, has the potential to be a positive thing. And then on the economic front, revenues are healthy, at least right now, and a big difference from where they were. And we also have evidence that voters are willing to support taxes being raised for specific things um, and have a, at least a willingness to, to, to support that concept and idea. So counterbalancing those positive things are certainly challenges that the state faces. So starting with the idea of revenue, yes, we have got to a healthy spot, but of course revenue remains as volatile as ever. Um, and also I would add to that that if you take a look at what the way in which California raises its revenue and connect it with a point I just made, we now have a system where we take the decisions about taxation and revenue, and those are primarily state ones, and yet we've pushed the policy decisions and program decisions down to the local level. So there's something of a disconnect there. And then the structures of our institutions, which in many cases were established in the 50s and 60s, decades ago, and then we've been evolving them incrementally over time, making little tinkers here and there. We have uh, hundreds of, of local governments in the state, as well as the state government, and it's not clear that we now have the right mix of power and authority and coordination to tackle some of the problems we face. And then last, somewhat ironically, in the state that most people, I think, associate with uh, uh, information management leading edge, right? Our state and, and, and to some degree many local government systems are really behind a lot of the rest of the country in terms of having the data they, they need to manage programs for their performance and kind of get the results or at least be able to see whether or not we're making progress and getting the results that we would like. So if you take those both opportunities and challenge, this is I think the, the, the kind of question we're putting to the panel of, of do we have the right mix of institutions in our government currently in California to to meet these opportunities and challenges as we look forward in Government 2.0. And so it's, it's a big question. We've got a talented panel who have experience both in state and local government. We have an equally talented moderator uh, to, to lead that discussion. Um, John Myers is a senior editor of the new California Politics and Government Desk at KQED. Um, he also was named recently by the Washington Post as one of the most influential state house reporters and has been covering state politics for about two decades. And last, I would point out that John was the moderator for all of the gubernatorial debates this last election cycle. So with that, I turn it over to you, John. All. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and good evening and welcome to the first debate of the 2018 gubernatorial campaign. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that? Wrong, wrong, wrong notes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wrong notes. God, I love when a joke works. You know, I mean, reporters, reporters don't tell jokes. I mean, this is like just, where's my wife? Because she doesn't think any of my jokes work. 
Um, th thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, it's uh, it's fun to do these events. It's fun to talk about you know to kind of step out of the news cycle a little bit and talk about um, what's happening in California. What works. What doesn't work. Why it doesn't. What we should do more of. What we should do less of. And I think uh, our three panelists certainly uh, know all of this well. So I I, I alluded to their their. Uh, uh, political star power here a moment ago, but let me be more precise with who they are. Closest to me, <clears throat> of course, is Ashley Swearingen, the incumbent mayor of Fresno, and uh, a candidate for state controller in this past election. Uh, sitting next to her is the state controller of the state of California, <laughs> but not for long. But wait, there's more. I'm like that old, uh, you know, those uh, commercials. John Chung, uh, the state controller for the last eight years, uh, the newly elected state treasurer of the state of California, next to him, and is a, a, a member before that of the Franchise Tax Board and the Board of Equalization. He's done everything. <laughs> uh, and then uh, next to him, speaking of people who've done everything, Antonio Villaraigosa, uh, the former mayor of the city of Los Angeles, and of course, the former speaker of the California State Assembly, and now teaching at the USC Price School in Los Angeles. And uh, so thank you, all of you. It's, uh, you. it's fun to be up here to talk to all of you. Let me, um, let me start off on a bit of a downer. Uh, while we're eating lunch, that's always a good time. Um, you know, if, it, if you look at the polling and all the other things that we talk about and you go out and you talk to Californians, which is more valuable a lot of times than just sitting thinking what they talk about, what they care about, Californians have a complicated relationship with their government, it seems like. Um, and we see that in a lot of the anecdotal and other kinds of things that we look at. I wonder, just as a starter, and it can go to anyone who wants to, to jump in at the beginning, do you think that they really get what you do in government? I mean, or is the problem that they get it and they aren't impressed? And what, 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 what is, the, what is the, the, the root of this issue, of this complex nature and sometimes frustration with government? Mayor, you're nodding your head. Well, so. I, yeah, it's an easy, easy response from the local level. Um, the point at which most people have the most direct interaction and where they literally are receiving services every day. You know, every street light that works, every stoplight that works, every pothole that gets filled, and I always remind people, and we also specialize in flushing toilets. So, you know, <laughs> when that works well and the faucets turn on, you're, you're actually a customer and interacting with local government and still, um, all of the interface we have, or much of the time with residents in our area, um, it's very unclear who's actually delivering their service to them, even among other local government jurisdictions. And so uh, in Fresno, for example, we started a Citizens Academy just to make sure people understood what we did, what we don't do, who they call, and that sort of thing. We did it for a couple of years, free program to the public. and. You know, the light bulb really went off for a lot of people and we found more resident engagement once they realized when their council's offices or uh, meetings were happening, how they could engage and that sort of thing. Um, but I was very surprised at just, you know, sort of city government is probably the most obvious and easiest to understand and yet even that uh, can be very complicated and convoluted for certainly the people in our area. At the risk of jumping here, no, no, my apologies, John. Can I jump to you, uh, Antonio Viragosa, from a local level as well? I mean, you know, you, you've seen it on local and state, but could you maybe play in off of Mayor Swearingen's thoughts there? I think the mayor is uh, right on target. I mean, people feel closer uh, to their government, to local government. Though I read uh, the PPIC poll that said uh, they didn't feel right. fa uh, favorable to any level of government, but. I think historically people feel a lot closer to uh, cities and counties, uh, particularly. Um, they feel uh, there's no question that many times they don't know what you do, as, as Mayor Swearingen said. Uh, uh, as an example, I've always been an advocate for immigration reform, and people will tell me, why didn't you keep your promise? You said we'd get comprehensive immigration reform, and I'd have to explain that I don't have a vote in the Congress. So. Uh, oftentimes people don't really understand what level of the government does what. Yeah, and jo John, I mean, from a, from a state perspective, I mean, there is a <coughs> lot of that frustration and, and uh, bridging that gap between what happens in Sacramento and what happens in these communities. I mean, you've seen it first and foremost, especially during all the tough fiscal times and the job of controller. Well, I think the, uh, the disconnect with government reflects greater societal issues, right? There, years ago, we know Robert Putnam from Harvard wrote a book, Bowling Alone. And so we saw the disintegration of our civic institutions. Uh, government, like everybody else, whether it's the church, whether it's nonprofit organizations, whether it's the pri private sector, uh, we, we, start have, we start having to, we need to start ha being direct, straightforward, and engaging with people. 
a lot of what I feel we're probably going to be talking about over this period uh, goes back to something that, um, that, that Governor Brown launched when he came into office in 2011. Uh, I, remember well the first time I had to Google the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, I've been Googling a lot with this governor and the Latin phrases and everything else, but I mean the, the governor made a, a, a very uh, demonstrative push at the beginning of his now to end third term of, of pushing more of the role of government back to the local level in some ways, shapes and forms. Um, that process is obviously, it's a work in progress. You heard Nancy McFadden said that to the crowd earlier today. Um, but it takes a lot of forms and there, there are bumps along the way and there are challenges with that. Just on a, on a conceptual uh, basis to begin with, do you think that's a good idea? To I do. To push more of that, yeah. I do, I absolutely do. I, I think more decision making, more resources along with that decision making should be pushed down to local government. Uh, people feel more comfortable, they trust it more historically. Uh, your dollar gets spent better. Um, as an example, uh, I certainly, I, I had no ph philosophical disagreement uh, with realignment, but your own PPIC study says you can't just do that without doing, providing the services and the, the resources for that. And in a city like mine and yours, um, uh, where disproportionately people who come out of uh, prisons go, uh, you got, if you don't have the resources, they're not going to be successful. Uh, so, uh, yes, push those decisions down, but provide the resources that cities need uh, and counties need uh, to uh, make it work. You know, it's interesting because kind of the two big demonstrations of this concept, which, by the way, I would answer your question like Mayor Virgos and say it's an easy yes. Conceptually, does it make more sense to have um, programs and resources at the level where they're most connected to people and you can do the best job of tracking results and that sort of thing? Yes. I mean, that, that, that's probably... We could save a lot of time on the panel and just concluding that. That's okay, good a good night, idea, right? Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> We're all done. Uh, okay, okay. And I also think, though, we got to step back and talk about the role of the state because I think we spend a lot of time um, all coming into agreement very quickly about how much we hate the state because it's you know it's the big bad bully and at the local government level they're usually the ones who are messing things up and all of that. So I think we do need to talk about that. But um, but in concept, we all probably would nod our heads on subsidiarity. Um, two biggest projects so far with realignment and then with local control funding formula in K-12. So just the feedback on the ground from, for example, the criminal justice system in Fresno County, all still very, very nervous. Probably, I would say, bordering on negative about realignment. But school districts, pretty favorable about LCFF. So, um, and uh, you know, I could probably come up with theories as to why each are different and maybe what that reaction is. but. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's certainly going to be sort of case by case, service by service, careful evaluation uh, before moving forward with other aspects of state government. It, it does seem, though, that so much of the discussion, as, uh, as, as Mayor Villaraigosa said at the, at the outset of his comments, comes back to the money issue. Um, and John, this is where I wanted to ask you a question because, I mean, one of the, I mean, in your job as controller, and of course, certainly you'll have a role in that as treasurer. I mean, you see the workings of the financial part, of the money part of where government goes, and it's difficult to track, it's difficult to know who's in charge. You spent a lot of time on, on a transparency uh, uh, campaign, I would argue, as controller in a lot of ways. But I mean, when you look at this pushing government down to the local level, can you really, when at the end of the day, the money still comes through the world of Sacramento? And it's, I mean, it's a, there's a challenge. I mean, they want more of that control, but at a certain point, who looks at the checks and balances and who's, who's really signing the checks? And yeah, let, let me point out my concern in regards to the, uh, as Ashley pointed out, none of us disagree about the con concept of you know, pushing down decision-making responsibilities to local government. I basically gave you a softball there at the top <laughs> for that part. But. Well, well, <laughs> well, however, the, the question is, the, you know, we have such fragment and we have so much friction uh, between state and local government. Unless we can heal that relationship, pushing more of the responsibilities down to local government raises more bell issues, right? Because one of the issues we have is we don't have standardized accounting for local government. So how you book revenues, how you book expenses is different city to city. 
and that creates great harm. It also creates great financial problems. One of the things that I tried to do is I created uh, by the numbers website, which has disclosed the last 12 years of financial history for the uh, local jurisdictions in the state of California. What I was trying to do is I was trying to prevent a collapse of our California's financial ecosystem, because when we have a Stockton, when we have a San Bernardino, when we have Mammoth Lakes, when we have Vallejo, we, saw, we were starting to witness what we saw with the termination or elimination of redevelopment agencies. When San Jose had problems, the ratings agencies started to take down the ratings for all redevelopment agencies. And it's not a commodity. All, those re, all of those re, redevelopment agencies have different strengths and different weaknesses, and ratings agencies ought to go in and analyze. I don't want cities to be impacted, so it's going to be more costly, and at the end of the day, it's going to hurt taxpayers in regards to dollars and in regards to services. But I think what you're saying then is very instructive because we are all linked, then, as you're saying. Yeah, I mean, the actions ecosystem. of one local entity can domino, ripple, whatever the appropriate image is, out to the others, and that was your That's concern. Important. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but on the issue of, of putting those dollars and what are spent out there and trying to have some transparency there, it gets to the other part that I find fascinating about this discussion of government toward the local level, but there's this partnership, a marriage, a rocky marriage between the state and locals. I think everybody uses everybody as a punching bag sometimes. It's easier to say it's Sacramento's problem or it's Fresno's problem. It works pretty well, yep. really statewide, I found. And I'm happy to report all of those, so that's not a problem. But, but it does raise the, it is the ongoing challenge of accountability. And the public wants to know where is the buck stop? Who's responsible? Who's respond? I mean, and, and that's a challenge that you have to work out as you rethink these roles of government. Because even if it's not just for the people who look at the books, as, as John, as you said, it's also the public, it's the voter. They want to know who, who do I take to task for this? All of us. All of you. Yeah, I mean, we're all accountable. Right. And, and I, but when everybody's accountable, you know, in the no eight years that I was mayor, I, I, I can tell you for the most part, I mean, remember, the state was going through the worst economic financial crisis uh, in decades, and so uh, there were going to have to be tough decisions. And I actually supported the governor and the legislature in, in many of the decisions they had to make. They were Faustian choices. Uh, there was tension, uh, particularly around community redevelopment. Uh, to, uh, were there problems with it? Absolutely. Should we have eliminated it in the middle of a crisis? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, uh, realignment. Uh, as I said, I'm not philosophically against it. In fact, I believe in it. But you got to have resources and, and services, uh, you know, connected to it. So, um, you know, we're all accountable. And, and for the most part, I felt we, I had a good relationship with the le legislature. Probably helped that my cousin was speaker and, you know, and Fabian was speaker before him. And, you know, um, but, um, you know, and, uh, we worked well with them for the most part, uh, but a lot of what the state is facing and cities and counties, I mean, let's, let's be clear, why, are, uh, why is there the tension? Well, since Prop 13, and I was here in Sacramento not so a few years ago, and I said, we've got to fix it, and we've got to, have, we've got to elect people with, with the courage to stand up and say it's broken. Our, you know, I think uh, Bob Hertzberg uh, is uh, doing a bill uh, to address uh, our broken tax system. We're going to keep on having these problems up and down if we don't fix it. And uh, it's, it's part of what creates the conflict between these different levels of government. Who had 1232 for Prop 13? I, I had that on my, uh, my bingo card. Uh, no, an interesting point. Mayor, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Well, I was just going to... Um, so, so basically what we're saying is it's pretty easy to agree that we want to decentralize decision making and we want to decentralize resources but we want to centralize accountability. And probably um, the state official who's got more connection to uh, the locals in terms of accountability and the expectation that he or she is on top of everything at all times is the state controller when it comes to cities. I got asked as a candidate whether or not he did enough for the city of Bell. And whether or not more, I mean. And what did you say? I said he did a great job. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and I would carry the baton, you know, to even higher levels. Um, so, so, so that, and it's not something we could resolve today, but it's something we have to think about. We can only today envision accountability in a centralized structure. Is that the best? 
Is that the best model? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, or is there a way to decentralize accountability if there, you know, and perhaps what John is suggesting, you know, if there's a, a streamlined, uniform way to report, then yeah, you could see accountability also filtering down to the, to the local level. Um, but I definitely think until we resolve that conflict, we're always going to get mixed results, and it's going to be dissatisfying. And, and, and yeah, please, John. Can, can I can I digress on Antonio's point about financial health? We're going to continue to make the same mistakes until we elevate our knowledge and discussion about how you grow California, right? I mean, and when we, you say our, do you mean the larger uh, California? It's all everyone. California and its local yeah. government. I I mean, if we discuss what is required. Uh, for California to be competitive in the 21st century, we, we don't have the same answers, right? But you, you have to go back to basic economics, you go back to behavioral finance, right? It, it's, we all have to understand debt cycles, you have to understand commodity cycles, you have to understand why California went from 8th pre-recession to 12th, and watch, track what happened with Australia, track what happened with Russia, track what happened with Turkey, watch where fixed investment goes, you know, after change in currency values and then it drops, change in investment and then it drops, and we're back to eighth again, right? But everybody's talking about the termination, the demise of California. Watch where we are in the cycle. And then in addition, watch the basic principle. One of the discussions we all need to have, over the long term, if you want California to be prosperous and watch where we are in the debt cycle, long-term growth and productivity has to exceed growth in debt and costs. Right, and so what we do in California is we track our growth, we sort of track our debt, we don't have conversations at both the state and local level, and so we, we, we have them too close to each other. So when but, you have the bad years that you talk about, we tank way below, and we're in a crisis that we should have avoided. But at the risk of getting way too down in the weeds, but what the heck. Um, what is that level though? What's, what's the appropriate gap in your mind between that growth and that debt? Because that becomes a political issue. You know, it's like, you know, some, some want a, a lot more growth and we do X with it. Some say as long as we're here. I mean, what, do, and I know everybody's got a different answer, but what's your answer since you brought it up? Well, the question, well, it's, it's going to change because we just passed the rainy day fund. But the mistake we made as Antonio t talked about, and I'll take a different tint, is what we should have done when we saw all those additional revenues during the 1977, 1978, Prop 13, and we built up $5 billion plus of additional reserves, California should have understood that we should have banked that money. Right? You don't spend it all at once, that we need that money set aside for bad times. That, frankly, and people, if we had that $5 billion setting set aside today, people would say, you know, that's a lot of money, we ought to do something. Whether you're Republican and you say tax breaks, or you're Democrat and say spend additionally on health care. Right? When we had the 2008 fiscal situation and Governor Schwarzenegger signed the budget for $103.4 billion, but we collected $87.8 billion, right? we had a $16 billion delta. When Governor Brown talks about trying to take down a $27 billion wall, right, and he doesn't include all those things, $5 billion is a drop in the bucket. We have to be used to having tons of money set aside to address weak years. Yeah. And frankly, we're lucky now because Federal Reserve policy push asset values up now so that we're accruing all these benefits. But we start to see any type of rapid price increases, right, we're gonna, we're gonna struggle in two to three years, or three to four years uh, in a normal cycle. Go, go ahead, you run up. Well, I just want to say, I mean, th that, that is so spot on. And the more that gets communicated and the more um, people really get a grasp of what a long range financial plan for the state of California looks like, or just grabbing onto the idea that we need one and we get out of the sort of 10 to 12 month budget cycle, I mean, that's a really key part of, to me, the future of the state. But I would say maybe dialing it back a couple of clicks from there, even, and uh, a lot of the uh, survey work that's been released recently is about public engagement and where are people and what are their views and you know how they feel about government that sort of thing and uh, my comment earlier about we really do need to talk about the, the role of the state um, is critical in that state government is going to set a tone for the, the activities the economic and political and governmental activities around the state a tone is set each and every day out of Sacramento it's happening right now and we have to ask ourselves is it a good tone or a bad tone in other words you know, the, the, vision, the vision can only really come from, uh, from a statewide perspective out of the state capital. And so um, before we kind of drill into like, oh, we have to have a long-term financial plan, you know, what I find missing today, and I don't think it's an indictment of any one person or administration, I think it's a long-term sort of thing, 
is um, it seems we have lost our way in terms of knowing, look, this is what we stand for, this is where we're going, and we're willing to put together the plans in order to get there. Um, we know that we inherited uh, an incredible place, an incredible infrastructure, but to me that vision, the oxygen in the lungs, is missing today. Once that gets set, then it becomes a lot easier to try to resolve all these other tinkering issues between who's doing what and who's accountable for what. As important as fiscal policy is, and uh, I think the controller uh, is spot on uh, about some of the financial and fiscal issues facing the state, it's much broader than that. It's, it's not just fiscal policy. Uh, you know, we've got to restore the luster of the California dream. And when we were, well, when I was going to school, they're a little younger than I am. Uh, when I was going to school, we were in the top five in per pupil spending. We had the best public schools in the country. People came to California. We became the number five economy in the world, not just because, you know, uh, it was pre-Prop 13 or anything. We became the, 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 uh, that state because we were investing in people. We were investing in infrastructure. We had the best roads and highways, airports and ports. Um, we've got to get back uh, to those kinds of investments. Uh, I've said uh, that uh, if we want to take on the challenge of restoring that luster, we've got to have the best public schools in the nation. And they've got to compete with the best public schools in the world. Uh, we've got to have universities that are affordable. Uh, universities that uh, we're making investments on, but that are also accountable to those investments. Uh, you know, when you ask about 2.0 and us, I mean, if I'd have waited on the state to do something to turn around LA public schools or to do something about infrastructure investment, I'd have been waiting for eight years. I didn't wait on the state. Uh, we had a 44% graduation rate when we started. It's 70%, 72% today. You know, we are, the effort, the effort, uh, you know, we had the most ambitious effort in transportation infrastructure, airport and port of any city in the country in that eight, eight year period of time. So we've got to make investments too. We do have to have smart mm -hmm. fiscal policy, but we also have to make investments. And one way to do that, again, accountability, is showing people that you're doing more with the money you got. Because <laughs> it's not just, as you said, I think very well, you know, one side wanted a, it, when we had a surplus, uh, wanted to, you know, a, tax, a giant tax cut that we couldn't afford. And the other side, let's be honest, the Democrats never saw a program they didn't like uh, to spend on. And so, you know, you got all this money, so we should make these investments. And, uh, but it's, it's fiscal policy, it's investments, uh, it's, it's understanding uh, the things that we need to do to be competitive uh, going into the 21st century. Well, one of the things that, that in, in your comments just now, I think you touched on, which I wanted to get to, so good transition, is that when we, you know, the topic of this discussion is government 2.0. Um, but I read that as a layman, and I, <laughs> it suggests to me that what we need then is an upgrade, I'm trying to use tech verbiage. But I think there are people who think we need an overhaul, and an upgrade and an overhaul are different. You know, we're way behind, those people would argue, in keeping up with what we need. Is it an upgrade? Is it an overhaul? Is it a tweak? Is it a pull it all out? I mean, what, what you know, what? It's all us. of that. What is it? It's all it's of that. It's all of that. All across the board. It so I, I've been right the whole about. time, then, is what yeah, you're Yeah, you've been right the whole time. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you got it. the mic, so, you know. <laughs> but please, I go mean, ahead. You know, it's, it's, it's all of that. There's some things we need to completely overhaul. There's some things we need to upgrade. What do we uh, need to completely overhaul? I think we need to completely overhaul uh, public education. We, we, we've got to be the, the best, we, we've got to have the best public schools in the United States of America and, and to compete with the best in the world, period. Uh, you know, look, when, when you look at this whole issue of income inequality and equality of opportunity, and for those of you who don't know, and I know most of you do because you wouldn't be at a conference like this, you know, we're way down where we thought we were when we said this is the country where you could start here, where a lot of us started, and get to there. Uh, we're not that country that we thought we were uh, on both the income inequality issue and on the quality of opportunity. And the way you, we always understood that you got there was you got an education and a world-class education and so you got a shot. 
And I believe and believe strongly that we got to give more people a shot. The PPIC uh, did a study, uh, as others have, that said we're going to be a million down by 2025 in the number of people that need to uh, have a, a college education. Two million down if you count college education in some college or the skills that you need to compete in a, in a knowledge economy. We can't, can't, that's not sustainable for us. So I, I think we've got to transform education. I'm, I'm a big believer that money counts, uh, but so do results. And that means we're going to have to rethink how we uh, fund our public schools, rethink uh, how we hold them accountable. Uh, we've got to employ best practices. We've got to challenge one another uh, that uh, to address the fact that today, if you're a poor kid growing up and going to an urban public school, your chances of making it are not quite like they were when I was going to public school. And uh, we gotta change that. How do you, but if I may, I wanna stay on the, on the income and the wealth gap issues for just a moment, because that was one of the things I wanted to talk about too. How do you, uh, how do you watch <coughs> that, deal with that, and hopefully not exacerbate that when you give when you when you shift the power structure from 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 state to local I mean can the gap widen I mean can there be areas that are havens of great spending on something and other areas where local officials made different decisions and they're not and we know some of the most struggling places in California are in the valley they're in rural inland California not to take away from urban California but we see those numbers what I mean how do you avoid exacerbating some of these problems if you're shifting uh, you know, if you're, if you're creating a, a system that's not oh, the same all around. I think that's a very legitimate concern and it's the reason why um, we've not shifted accountability away from a centralized point in Sacramento. I mean, that, that, would, uh, that would argue for, look, you need an independent outside you know, legislative or, or uh, administrative body that's making sure you don't end up losing school districts and small communities through the cracks, right? Um, but I guess I would just challenge that notion and say maybe we maybe we need to think about accountability differently, um, and and maybe there are different roles for the state to play. I, I don't I think it would be a mistake to say there are two poles here, you know, perfect accountability that's centralized in Sacramento, or you know everybody's doing whatever they want and it, nobody knows what's going on and that's decentralization. I, there's got to be somewhere in the middle um, where we actually get the benefits of sort of both. You know, we, we value making sure that our system statewide remains strong at, at the local level. Uh, we value that. We think the best way to achieve that may look a little differently than the way we're doing it today. We've certainly seen some of these topics, though, haven't we, in, um, in public safety realignment. Counties have approached the, the, the implementation of that differently. Um, we've seen it in public employee pensions and retirement benefits. Local communities and local elected officials make decisions about those benefit packages that ultimately come back in some way that are, have a disparate rate to them. So I mean, it's, it, it seems to be, if I, if I step back and look, it's something we've struggled with a lot. And as we are talking about re-engineering, reinventing, changing government, I mean, this is, this is a familiar topic, it seems like. Yeah, can, can, Ashley is absolutely correct on the point that you, you, it can't, you can't be bipolar uh, in regards to the approach to governance. So we have to work together. And frankly, America has to figure this out really quickly. Yeah, the that's right. the, the uh, disconnect that we see between both parties is hurting us as we compete in the 21st century. Right, the, uh, in, in our years, we grew up when, um, when America was one third of the world's economy. Today, we are 20% of the world's economy. Uh, we have to think about the demographic challenges that we have. We graduate about 70,000 scientists. Uh, China graduates not at the same level, but about 300 scient scientists. They have 1.3, I'm sorry? You said 300? 300, yeah. Uh, 300,000? Yeah. From higher, from higher education okay. of scientists a year. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Student. You said 300. You meant 300,000. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's trying to help you. Oh, thank you. I'm so, I, I didn't see know what to say. See how we're, we're all already. getting along, right? See, uh, <laughs> Korea, South Korea graduates the same number of scientists. Yeah. Right. And so when you look at 1.3 uh, billion <coughs> people in China, 330 million in the United States of America, 1.1 billion in India, uh, and their uh, moti is reforming their economy, right, we have to think about three things. We have to think about our technology stack, we have to think about our financial stack, right, and Antonio was right, financial policy is social policy. So when we talk about social policy, none of it works unless our finances work. And then we think, ha have to think global. And so, right, we have to think about, when I think about competing against Texas, I think about Fresno. Because when you talk about relative real estate prices, 
same median prices, Texas' most expensive market is Austin, and it compares to Fresno. And so I'm thinking, we need that state-local partnership because how do we add taxes, how do we add regulations, and you don't want all city governance because we need regu uh, regional planning to make the whole area competitive. And frankly, that's, we're not going to succeed in the Central Valley, right? We've got to boost up Fresno, which actually is doing a great job, to compete against the Austins. That's how we win the 21st century in California. So, but on, on, on one of those fronts there, on when you look at, um, because again, we, a lot of things come back to money, and you said fiscal policy is social policy. But I want to talk about, about fiscal policy for just a moment and the notion of fiscal stability at the local level, at the state level. I mean, everyone is, is very keyed in. We certainly have uh, flirted with a, a, a heck of a lot of challenges on all levels over the last decade. Um, what is the state's role uh, when you look at local levels? Uh, I mean, because you have some communities where bankruptcy has become an issue, uh, and for lots of reasons. Does the state have a role in stepping in to save these communities, do you let it burn it down? I mean, you know, they're, they're, and there's a different philosophy in different places. Like, hey, you made that problem, Vallejo, Stockton, San Bernardino, or no, we've got to come in, we've got to say, you know, there's a larger thing here. Who, who gets the responsibility when things don't go there? How do we deal with those? I mean, none of you want bad things to happen, but. I'm like having waves of nausea over me right now. Is uh, Did you as, eat, uh, or was that <laughs> no, my question? as I'm uh, contemplating. Sorry, okay. um, uh, yeah, no, it wasn't the food. Um, as I'm just thinking back on the last five or six years and you know, knowing what it's like to lead a city of you know, 500,000 people and being perilously close to bankruptcy, it never crossed my mind ever once uh, to go to the state and try to get them to do something. I mean, it just, I, I don't think that's the responsible thing to do. I mean, we took care of it at the local level. We made the cuts. We put the long-term financial plans into place. We had to, uh, we had to navigate those waters and uh, I, I can't imagine uh, really any strong case for thinking the state was going to step in in any way, shape, or form. But I'll tell you what, when that's happening at the local level and then you've got the mess that Sacramento has been in financially, I mean, it, it is very, very frightening. And um, if that alone, I keep telling my constituents in Fresno, as long as I'm, I have to be really dramatic when you're a mayor, which Mayor Viewer goes, that can show us very well. Um, so, you know, as long as I breathe breath on this, on this planet, if my city ever goes down the same path that led to the mess we were just in, I mean, what, so many of us who have lived through this, and I, I have to hope and believe that people in Sacramento would do the same thing. Like, we're, we are so not out of the woods yet, it's not even funny. I, I mean, we're talking a 10, 15, 20 year turnaround. And if, it, if we plan for 20 and it's but, 10, that's great, right? But if you don't, if you're not, the, if, if, if it's not you, if it's the elected officials who can't solve that problem, does the state have a responsibility? Yeah, the is answer the, is we have a collective responsibility. Just like accountability, I said is, uh, has to be accountability at all levels of government. Absolutely, I, I think the federal government had a responsibility to do something about Detroit. Uh, I don't think that you can allow a major state, you know, a major city in a major state uh, go under that way. And, and I think there, there is a way, not to bring up Prop 13 again, Joel, I love you dearly, um, but you know, when our property taxes got shifted and went back up there and all this is a you know the, we, we had to change paradigm and, and there is a collective responsibility but she's right I mean when we were going when everybody said that LA was going to go bankrupt and I said not on my watch a 1.3 billion dollar structural deficit a fourth of the of the uh, of our general fund uh, we had to make tough tough choices it would have been great to have the kind of partnership with the state where we, you know, we're an engine of California. I mean, the, the LA metropolitan economy, if you don't know, is, in, I think we're seventh now, right? The state? The state is eighth. Eighth. So uh, the, the, the metropolitan area is 15 or 16. Uh, you no, know, actually 15 is New York. We're 16. Uh, you know, we're the en one of the engines of California. So. Uh, Yes, I do think we have a collective responsibility. Uh, I always used to say the difference between, and I, as you said, used to be speaker, so I do know a little bit about this. The difference between the federal government and the state is the federal government gets to print money. The state, when they have a crisis, a uh, budgetary crisis, when the state has a budgetary crisis, they get to shift the responsibility on cities, counties, and school districts. 
cities, counties, and schools, that's where the buck stops. You gotta, you gotta make the tough call. And that's why we had the level of layoffs, furloughs, you know, the pension reform, which was much more far reaching than what happened here at the state. It, we had to make those calls or we would have gone under. And um, I do believe that there is a responsibility for us to work collectively smart, not to shift it to the state, because, you know, ultimately, it's on uh, you know city counties and school districts, but to work smarter together than we have historically, uh, I really do. But each of you, uh, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, John, quickly, well, and, the, and we'll the, go the, with questions the, in a moment. Yeah, the idea is you don't want to create the moral ha hazard, right? So the state ought to be involved, and frankly, we were involved. The uh, we approached the Department of Finance. We worked with when Paul was at the department, uh, Treasurer's uh, office, and us, and we said we wanted to provide assistance. But we're not the backstop if you go under, right? right. We understand the financial. E we understand the financial ecosystem. We want to provide the uh, expertise, but frankly, local government doesn't want the expertise, and so we have to figure out how we bridge that going forward. So, a couple of things here, and I'm mindful of the fact that all of you get to ask some questions in a moment too. So, um, try to keep all. I got. I got a lot. You know, if you want to hang out for a while, I mean, <laughs> we'll go into the cocktail hour, which will get a lot more fun. But um, all of you, um, you all operate in the world of politics. Uh, we've had a great discussion about policy here, but let's, let's just admit you're all politicians in a way. I know you don't really want to define yourself that way, but I did it. Um, the, the world of politics sometimes works to get things done, and sometimes it can be an impediment. And, and, and the, the, the political reality of something can overtake a good policy idea. Um, and I'm curious if you all would mind just sharing a, a, an anecdote, if you have one, of where you have seen the politics change what could be a good idea. That, or something, uh-oh, uh, yeah, Mayor Mayor was going you, right off the bat there. You, you, but I'm, I'm curious to You speak to about politics as yeah. if it's a pejorative term. No. And let, let me just say this. To all those, and I know a bunch of them, public servants, who think they're above politics, I say, Excuse me, I didn't want to thank you, but <laughs> I realized. What is politics? It's, it's the art of selling the policy. Uh, it's the art of selling, of building a coalition. It's the art of communicating what you want to do. I mean, politics, it, it's the art of winning over. I, I don't have any uh, pejorative sense about politics. I was proud to be a public servant. I was honored, but I was also you know, I understood that politics was the key. If I tell people, if all you like is policy, you ought to be a university professor. It's a great thing. But, you know, politics... Uh -oh. And here they all come And there's nothing you. wrong with the university. <laughs> By the way, I'm a, I'm a lecturer at uh, USC. <laughs> USC's in the house, right? <laughs> Though I am a Bruin. Um, uh, Stanford. God. Go Bears. What a game. <laughs> no, not Bears. Cardinals. Cardinals. Oh, you, I, went, I went to Cal you, graduate school. Please yeah, continue, right. Mayor. Let's know. So, yeah. um, you know, look, I, 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 I don't have any problem saying that, you know, I, I was a politician in the sense of what politics means to public service. Um, and if you want an antidote, you said an antidote about... Well, I, fr frankly, if you weren't in politics, I wouldn't have a job. So I have no problem with politics <laughs> either. I mean, hey, it keeps me employed. I'm just trying to understand that sometimes the political challenge is different than the policy challenge. And, and, so, and so many of you talk about good ideas, but you have to ultimately sell those in the Absolutely. arena of ideas. And I'm just curious what that experience has been like for you. I mean, if there are times where you find that the political challenge is very different than the policy challenge, and yeah, sometimes yeah, harder. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll give you an give example. Uh, for me, the anecdote was, uh, you know, I, I, the joke about me, if you live in LA, was that, you know, I said, dream with me. And, and, I talked about a subway to the sea and that we were going to build a, a world-class public transportation system. And for almost weeks after, people started writing and saying, well, where's the subway to the sea? Where, where's it at? You know, it's like you said you were going to build a subway, as if anybody builds a subway, right? And, you know, um, eight years later, you know, a busway, three light rail lines, four, uh, four other lines in construction. Uh, we did it, and the fact of the matter is, you know, uh, you oftentimes have things that you say you're going to do, and and they're hard to do, and so you got to 
do the politics and you got to build the support and you got to sell the idea. I did congestion pricing. Nobody, the, you know, uh, you know, they tried it in New York, they tried it in San Francisco, they couldn't get it done. I had the entire congressional delegation, Democrats against it because they said it hurt poor people, Republicans against it because they said freeways ought to be free and we already paid for it. In the end, we built it. So, you know, that's an example to me of one of a long line of policy ideas that you have that you have to roll up your sleeves and get, you know, in the trenches and can't be afraid of it. You gotta be a salesman. Yeah, and you yep. gotta be a salesman and you gotta be a schlepper and you gotta be a, you know, a, a sick, I mean, not a sick, a supplicant. You gotta do it all. John, you had you were in. So in 2008, 2009, I referenced earlier the, uh, because we had a budget that was so uh, badly unbalanced in February of 2009, I held back your tax refunds for 23 days because the state had $2.7 billion in cash in our state treasury to pay $10 billion worth of bills. Ah, oh, those were the days. Weren't the, uh, <laughs> then in July, beginning July 2nd of 2009, I started issuing the first of 450,000 right. IOUs to the tune of $2.6 billion, right? I saw the pain of real people. I had local government officials, two counties in Northern California, hey, say, John, we're on the verge of bankruptcy, right? We need protection. So we try to handle the cash so that they didn't go into bankruptcy. They didn't go into bankruptcy. So a couple years later, the, after the voters passed Proposition 25, Governor Brown vetoed the budget uh, the next morning to make a statement that it was so out, out of balance. Antonio was kind enough to say, I support your decision, John, later on. Bill Locke here four days later said, that budget's not financeable. We did the study, right, and then we said, we're not going to pay the legislators. We were going to try to enforce the will of Proposition 25 because we wanted to send a statement. That made you a popular guy inside yeah, the state. Well, I was, I was the most unpopular <laughs> person here in Sacramento. The, uh, not right, with me. Yeah, you were, you were down in oh, L.A. Right? Though. So, yeah. In but, Fresno and L.A., you were oh, rocking yeah, we it. Love no, it. Don't worry. But right, yeah. that's good policy because we wanted the legislature to understand that we, you can't put us back because in California in 2009, we were near functional bankruptcy. No legal bankruptcy under 1937 bankruptcy provisions, but nearly functionally bankrupt, right? The world's 12th largest economy around that time, between 8th and 12th. But I knew the political price, right? I was in the penalty box for two years. Anything I wanted <laughs> from the legislature was a dead no, right? And then, frankly, I was ostracized, right? You go to public events and, right, they had the thing, John, we can't talk to you publicly, right? You're, you're on the other side, right? So it'd be me at a public event and legislators at the other side. But I've endorsed John in every election he's ever been in. <laughs> Thanks. I have. Thanks. I have. Right. But that's but 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 that's, the, the, the that's challenge, right. the policy yeah. versus the, the politics. The, the politics and, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, just you know, so um, here we are in the middle <coughs> of a drought, or thankfully not. The rain is coming today, so hopefully our our uh, water supply looks a lot better this year. But uh, in the Central Valley, where probably um, it's more acute from a water perspective, most people understand. You know, water supports our economy, all of that sort of thing. Um, so our city has been sitting on. Um, some of the best water rights in the entire state. In fact, if we accessed all of the water that we actually have rights to, we would be the most water rich city on the West Coast. Um, and yet, because for 25 or 30 years, no elected official ever wanted to look their constituents in the eye and say, oh, by the way, that water that we have a right to is going down the river each and every year. We're leaving it on the table for other people to use because we don't want to raise a bill to potentially build the storage and the treatment facilities. For 25 years, we've basically suppressed the cost of water in our city, uh, and in my administration, we, we changed that. It took us uh, now, gosh, it's been four years, we've had two runs at it, uh, but ultimately, we believe the ratepayers are going to go forward with a fairly substantial increase as a Republican mayor. You know, it's not fun to look at people and say, yeah, we need to raise your water bill. It was certainly something on the campaign trail of my most recent election that I got hit on. But we're changing a condition that will benefit our city for the next 50 years. There is a political price to be paid, but who cares? That's why we sign up for these jobs, is to leave things differently and to, in my case, in Fresno, we've had so many plans that have gone by the wayside for 25, 30, 40, 50 years. No one will take on the political battle. Uh, and I think people are just tired of not seeing progress. So, you know, while I took a political hit, I think ultimately people will know it's the right thing to do and they'll come along and support the rate plan. So, uh, one quick question for me before we go to you all with some of your questions and there'll be microphones around, we'll play that uh, game. But if I could get all of you to, uh, just for a moment, we've talked about a lot of things, but 
ultimately back to the accountability issue, but back to the tracking, defining success, defining change, defining progress. How, I mean, any advice from any of you? How do you, how on, on the local level uh, of all the changes that are coming from Sacramento, on the state level, um, how do we track progress, and, and, and what, how do I mean, maybe how do we define it, but what do we do? What's the, is, I, is there any way to... And, I brought in McKenzie, because uh, I had all these campaign promises, which everybody talked about that I had just a broad, uh, you know, agenda and, and a lot of campaign promises. What we did, we, we brought in uh, McKenzie. Uh, I ended up hiring them. A number of them came on staff. Uh, we had uh, we did metrics around every campaign promise, uh, every department. We uh, quarterly meetings. We we really tried to run things uh, a lot differently than we had in the past. Uh, I had great chiefs of staff, frankly, that made sure the trains were running on time and that, that, uh, that made sure that uh, all of our departments and 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 that. that the entire city was focused on those things. And I, I think we all need to be a, a lot um, better about managing, you know, our resources. And that's what I did, but yeah. imagine no, this happened. Good. Yeah, you have to measure, measure. You have to have metrics. In my first, second day in office as the state controller, I said, we want to be the best public fiscal office in the United States of America. We went through the different divisions. Unclaimed property, today we have the most advanced laws of, of any state in regards to unclaimed property. Uh, All-time record in the controller's office for audits was Kathleen Cano. She did $2.5 billion in eight years. Uh, the controller's office last month surpassed $9 billion in regards to audit findings. So you go across the board and you go office by office, but what you can't capture as well, we have to think qualitatively. Mine is when somebody resides here, and what Antonio said at the beginning, is this the best state for a young child to develop their life in? Right, and so we're going to have to figure out how you measure that. Interesting. And Ashley, and then uh, warning for the mics. I'm coming to you next. Well, I, I think that's ultimately the biggest challenge is, um, is finding the way to measure something like, is this the best place for a child to grow up in? So um, I feel like we're in that stage where we're doing lots of great data dumps. Um, because of the proliferation of technology, I mean, there's just so much available information. Certainly at the local government level, we're all publishing, you know, every salary of every person who works in our agency, and it's just, it's sort of dumped out there. So um, the next phase is going to have to be about taking that information, interpreting it, and making sure that it's meaningful, um, which is going to require, and maybe this is what uh, sort of decentralized accountability looks like, is at least getting agreement on what the marks are but then requiring that that information be held and kept and made available at the local level. So it's more, and from the state's perspective, it's making sure that it's there, not trying to roll it up and decipher it and then you know, issue some kind of a report card at a statewide level. Boy, you hit on one that I would love to talk about, but I won't, which is agreeing on the data and whether the data is, is accurate. That's very difficult. Uh, that's another whole darn panel. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess there's a question over here, so let's go that way first, and then uh, there are folks around. So. Uh, during uh, the depths of the local government fiscal crisis we had back in 2012, uh, Treasurer Lockyer called for an early warning system for local government fiscal distress. Um, now that you've built uh, by the numbers, uh, Controller Chung, I was wondering whether you would think about building a fiscal early warning system on top of that. What we're going to do is when I, the, uh, I get to the Treasurer's office, we're going we're gonna to try to build more of those state-local partnerships in regards to best practices for financial education. Right? You don't want people just to look at the traditional four major measures of uh, financial risk for local jurisdictions. One of the things that we did, the, uh, and I haven't shared with anybody, we've been going to ratings agencies in New York so that they would get past formulaic analysis of local government and state government and to parse more details to s try to de uh, develop something more organically to indicate the financial health of uh, jurisdictions. If you go to my By the Numbers website, but it will help people because you can draw comparisons between jurisdictions or across jurisdictions. One of the things that we should have isolated if that had been in place earlier is that, for instance, Vallejo used to be a base, ho home of you know, bases, right? And so they used to collect 70, 80 million dollars a year from the federal government when they knew the next year was going to drop to 35 million dollars. That's why we put it up. You wanted to create that citizen discussion with their local elected officials. Hey, we're going we're to lose half the revenues from this 
our principal or one of our principal sources. What are we going to do in regards to service adjustments, uh, cost controls? What reaction are you getting quickly to the rating agencies when you go to Call, say? And called uh, called state of the art uh, website. It's the most advanced in the country. Uh, one of the uh, leading opinion makers said it's frankly going to change the way you analyze cities across. California, and frankly, they were hoping the rest of the nation picked up by the numbers website. Yeah, I'm writing down news stories here, so sorry, plain reporter. Uh, which, which way are you going this way? Oh, they're pointing that way. Yes. Thank you, I'll stand. <clears throat> All right, uh, so I've learned about realignment since moving to California, and I applaud it for moving uh, people back to the local communities. Um, but looking beyond imprisonment, how can or how should uh, local, local governments actually reimagine policing in their communities to actually remediate and improve those communities, which might actually reduce costs over time. Well, I don't want to refer to a PPIC study again, but I will. That they did uh, a recently. lot of name dropping going on. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. I prepare like you do. Um, I'm a big believer uh, in a smart approach. Uh, to criminal justice. I think we need to put the justice back in the criminal justice system. Uh, I argued for uh, adding more cops if we wanted community policing, and I believed in community and constitutional policing. We were under a federal consent decree, which I supported when I ran in 2001, the only candidate initially to support it, and I supported it once I was mayor. I said, we're going to have to fix this department, which had a, a history of, of problems, uh, particularly in the African-American, but also the Latino community. Uh, we, so we did a number of things. We, we, put, uh, we, we, we stood for the proposition that uh, in a democracy, you have to have constitutional policing and that citizen, citizens and civilians oversee that police department. I put former uh, civil rights leaders, uh, uh, U.S. attorneys, people that understood that uh, it, the rule of law. Uh, we added a thousand cops. Uh, we had the most, uh, I mean, when you look at LA, we're about 67% uh, people from Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And that's about what we are uh, in our police department, 20% women. Uh, we also did other things. We, uh, pr uh, prevention and intervention programs. Uh, we spend more today than we, had ever uh, in, in that area, but we did it smarter. Uh, I was an at-risk kid, but there are, are gradations of that. You know, at risk because I grew up in a hope of domestic violence, no dad, got in trouble from time to time. But you know, there are gradations. If you're, if, if you have no father, but your father was in, I mean, your father was in jail. Your brother's in a in a prison uh, as well. Your mother's. Uh, you know, on drugs, you're even more at risk. So we put together with experts uh, a prevention and intervention program that's state of the art. Uh, USAID uses it today uh, in uh, Nicaragua, uh, El Salvador, and uh, Guatemala. Um, we were very focused on, uh, you know, realignment because what we said was we're philosophically for it. But we got to have money for reentry programs. We got to have money uh, for training uh, initiatives to, to bring people uh, to um, you know into the world of work. I, I personally believe uh, you know that uh, we can't if somebody served their time, we can't keep on demonizing them and preventing them from working and being productive the way that we do. I mean, today, if you're a felon, you can't vote, you can't work, you can't, I mean, you're like basically treated as a leper. We've got to change that paradigm. Uh, and that's why from my vantage point, you know, we're all just a step away from a Ferguson until we address uh, uh, this issue. And, and I also believe finally, and I have since 1994 when I've talked about prison building uh, and actually worked with Governor Wilson on a compassionate release program and, and the like, we got to address the fact that we incarcerate more people today uh, than any state, we're the biggest, but any state in the country, most people would think it's Texas or Mississippi, it's California, but the country incarcerates more people than China and Russia together and disproportionately they're black, Latino and poor. And you, you all have been following Ferguson 
and know that if you're black and you smoke pot, you're 21, I think the number was, I don't know, 21 times more likely to be arrested. We gotta fix that. Uh, that's why I said we gotta invest in people, we gotta educate them, we've gotta address uh, on a broad cross section the safety net, uh, but what we have today is not working. And it's a big reason why. When you see why we don't have money for public schools and universities, it's because we're, the money for corrections has gone way up. You all did a study which said, put more money in cops. You do, cops make more sense because they keep crime down lo locally than, than corrections do because the recidivism rate for people that go to prison is what today, I don't remember, I knew it when I was in the legislature, I think it's 76%, 74%, it's just, we gotta overhaul that whole system and, and make investments, smart, tough policing. By the way, LA went, a 45% drop in violent crime, a 45% drop in homicides, the safest big city in, in America along with New York, and a Harvard study uh, looking at African American and Latino perceptions of the police department, the most positive perceptions of the police department in generations. So uh, we still have a lot of work to do, uh, but you know, uh, we, we understood constitutional community policing, making investments, prevention and intervention, and uh, helping people get to be productive and to work. At the risk of, of, of being like a moderator in a, in a debate, um, <coughs> with the lightning question, I want to be quite frank about the governor in the office now and the realignment of public safety. Uh, are we on the right track or wrong track on that? And well, first I ask of all, you, I, I'm a big supporter of the governor. Right track. Um, but with respect to realignment, I, I've, I think I've made my point Good. Per perfectly clear. I, I don't support yeah. realignment without the services that they need. And the problem in LA That City, yellow light is flashing. Well, so wait, one second. Sorry. The problem with LA and Fresno, LA is LA County. So when, when you give the money to the county and not to the city, hey, hold it. We have, they disproportionately come to the city of LA, not the suburbs in LA County. So that's why we said from the beginning, you gotta provide the resources and the services that come with it. Right track, wrong track. Right track if you add additional uh, finan financial assistance. What Antonio said, we need more early intervention. Antonio and I sit on Bob Ross's kitchen cabinet for men and boys of African American and Latinos yes. to try to get more families involved to try to reduce those costs. What Antonio talked about in regards to costs, if you look at four, four decades ago, state budget 3% went to corrections today, we're looking between nine and 10%. Right, so. right, right track, wrong track. Um, I think conceptually, it's an acceptable path to go down. It's all about the execution. Acceptable, execution. that doesn't sound like an endorsement. I know, I thought, uh, uh, in, you know, in the central San Joaquin Valley, there's still a lot of angst about, about whether or not this is the right, the right path. So I think it's all about execution risk. If programs can be executed well, um, I think it, the, the change can be absorbed. I apologize for those who have other questions in the audience. You are the moderator. Clock, and I know that I will not get asked back to a PPIC event if I don't end it on time. But Antonio Villagrosa, John Chung, Ashley Swearing, thank you.